Today we're going to be talking about unbiased PN junctions. So let's first talk very briefly about what they look like. Okay. So with regards to junction structure, um, realistically, we're going to see something that looks like this. So we have our substrate material. Arbitrarily, I am choosing this to be a P-type substrate. And then we are going to have what's called an N-well that is implanted inside this substrate. Something like this. Um, so this N-well is formed, so we take a doped silicon wafer, uh, it's been doped probably pretty lightly P-type, somewhere in the ballpark of 10 to the 15, um, except for atoms per cubic centimeter. And then we use either ion implantation or some other process to specifically irradiate selected areas of our substrate material with uh, N-type dopus. And then we use a thermal diffusion process, effectively just means we heat the crystal up until all of those dopants diffuse out to form us a nice region called an N-well, where we have a roughly um, constant electron concentration like so. Um, and the junction between this N region and this P region is the PN junction. Um, if we were looking at a diode specifically, we would also take into account we would have a metal region here giving us contact. So this would be our cathode. And then we would have a metal region out here serving as our anode. So a diode structure contains not only a PN junction, but it also contains two metal semiconductor junctions, which are what we're going to talk about after we wrap up PN junctions. Um, so the PN junction occurs at the interface between the P substrate and the N well. Um, like I said, metal semiconductor junctions occur at the interface between the metal contacts and the semiconductor regions. Uh, this type of doping uh, that we have here where the N-well is embedded inside of a P-substrate is what's called compensation doping. Um, and so that has some impacts on the characteristics of the device. Uh, we're not going to talk about them too much, but let's really think about things here, right? So if our P-type substrate were doped with 10 to the 15 acceptor atoms per cubic centimeter evenly distributed across the entire uh, substrate material, and we want to make a region of this thing n-type, at a minimum, we have to put in more dopants than we do acceptors. Because if we put an equal amount of acceptors, this region would just be effectively neutral. It would have a whole bunch of impurities in it, right? Two times whatever the acceptor concentration was, but it wouldn't have any free charge carriers really to speak of. In order to make this region have three charge carriers, we have to go beyond the background level of doping in order to make that happen. So I just wanted to make that pretty clear. Like realistically, uh, our N well is going to be at least 10 times as doped as our substrate would be in order for us to get anything useful out of it. It's much more likely to be 100 to 1,000 times more heavily doped. Okay, So this is what an actual PN junction looks like. Um, but we are going to look at an idealized version, which is called a metallurgical, metallurgical junction. Uh, how many of you guys know about uh, cold welding? So cold welding is something that happens if you were to get two materials that are made of the same things close to each other in space. They literally bond together. 
So that's what we're going to look at here effectively. We're going to look at what would happen if we were able to have a section of p-type material and a section of n-type material, and then somehow fuse them together at a single interface. Um, it's going to be a little easier to figure out what's going on with that kind of idealized representation than worrying about curves and all that kind of jazz like we might actually see through an implantation process. Okay. So our simplified representation would look something like this. Over here on the left-hand side, is going to be my neutral P region. And here is our anode terminal. And then over here on the right-hand side, will be our neutral N region. Like so. In this interface, I'm going to label with M, which stands for a metallurgical junction. Um, and I'm going to draw this such that there are intentionally more donor atoms on the N side of the crystal than there are acceptor atoms on the P side of the crystal. So we might have something like this. So here are going to be our acceptor atoms. Right now, I'm just drawing the nuclei. And then each of these is going to have an associated hole. So that at this point in time, we have a completely electrically neutral theory, right? Every single one of our acceptor atoms still has its hole leaving us with a completely net neutral charge. On the N region, I'm going to do the same thing. And I'm going to put in a whole bunch of electrons. Like so. And just for while I'm at it, let me label my cathode. Uh, I'm going to define a couple of things here as well in terms of space. So our junction is going to be at x is equal to zero. And then out here at the negative or the left side, um, we're going to have x is equal to negative LP. So this is the length of the P side of the junction. And then over here, we have x is equal to positive ln giving us the length of the n side of the junction. If we were to look at our charge concentrations at this specific moment in time, so this is like the instant in time at which these two crystals touch each other, we might have something like this.
So, bless you. Um, let me put it right here. So this red line right here is going to represent my whole concentration. So this is going to be Na, and it will be approximately equal to the whole concentration on the left-hand side. And then this blue line down here will be approximately Ni squared over Na. And this is the electron concentration on the P side, right? Then over here on the right, we would have the electron concentration on the N side, which will be approximately equal to NZ. And then down here, we would have the whole concentration on the N side. That'll be about Ni squared over Nd. And here's my junction. Here is x is equal to zero. So if we look at these concentrations, what can we see? Well, if we look at the P side of the crystal, so the left-hand side of the crystal, we can see that we have a pretty substantial whole concentration and then an abrupt shift once we hit our metallurgical junction to a very low whole concentration. So what should we expect to happen? We have a high concentration on one side, a low concentration on the other. This is uh, right for the fusion, absolutely right. So we should see that holes will diffuse from left to right in this crystal. If we look at our electron concentrations, we have an extraordinarily high electron concentration on the N side, and then a much lower electron concentration on the P side. And so we should see that electrons are going to diffuse from right to left. So what's going to happen to these diffusing charge carriers as they get in the region of the junction? They're going to see the opposite type of charge carriers, and we're going to have a significant amount of recombination, right? So these diffusing holes, uh, diffusing, goodness gracious, diffusing holes and electrons near the junction are going to recombine, and they're going to leave behind what we call a depletion region. So this right here is going on at, let's call it, P is equal to zero minus the moment right before or the moment at which our things touch each other after we allow all of those carriers um, to recombine with each other, we're going to have something that looks like this. So, we're going to have something like that. And so what we're going to see, uh, let me put a dashed line here. Uh, 
point. So, so this dashed line is trying to define our depletion region or our space charge layer, which has a width of capital W naught at thermal equilibrium. Let me go back through here really quickly and put all of my free charge carriers. Like so, this is zero, this is our metallurgical junction. We're going to define this point to be negative WP naught, and this point to be positive WN naught, representing the width of the depletion region extending into the T side of the crystal, that's the left-hand guy, and the width of the depletion region extending into the uh, N side of the crystal, that's the WN naught guy over there, right? So we have this region here in the center that is effectively devoid of free charge carriers. If I were to draw on um, the carrier concentrations, effectively we would just have a line, a dash line here, and these guys would be zero. We have a dash line roughly right here, and this portion right here and here would also be zero. Our space charge layer is for all intents and purposes, completely devoid of free charge carriers, um, which is why we call it a depletion region. That means that there is left over negative charge on the P side of the crystal because all of those acceptor atoms holes have recombined, leaving behind negatively charged nuclei. And over here on the right-hand side, we have a bunch of positively charged donor atoms whose electrons have all recombined, leaving behind a bound layer of positive charge. So we're going to have some amount of charge here. Let's call this Q sub P. Some amount of charge in this region. Call it Q sub N. Matthew, you were raising your hand. Okay. So let me ask you guys the question. The fusion has occurred, and then it arbitrarily stops once we get to this point. So why did our diffusion stop? Oh, very much not the case, right? So let me draw our carrier concentrations to show you not to be a dick, but why that was so incredibly wrong. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, I'm. <laughs> so. That's the edge of our depletion region on the P side. Here's the edge of our depletion region on the end side. So my holes should be here, and then they drop down effectively to zero. I'm gonna stay zero. And then something like this. And then for my electrons, something like this, right? Where the red curve is for holes and the blue curve is for electrons. That's the color convention that I've decided to use. So I would argue that the concentration gradient is still very much there, right? So that is not the reason that diffusion stopped. In fact, it's the reason why we should assume that diffusion would keep on happening until the entire crystal just becomes completely devoid of free electron or free charge carriers, except for the fact that one side is built more heavily than the other. So why doesn't the N side eventually completely take over the P side in this particular case is what we're trying to figure out. James. Exactly right. 
So we have stored positive charge here and stored negative charge here. Because that charge is physically separated from each other, it is going to establish an electric field. The electric field will be oriented from the positive charge to the negative charge. So we are going to have, this is getting really busy, but. We are going to have an E field. Directed from the N side to the P side. Okay. Now, just to be clear here, we know that holes are diffusing this way or attempting to, an electron diffusion. is going this way. So once this space charge layer has been established, what does the diffusing hole see? It sees a barrier that's preventing it from diffusing further. Because remember that holes um, act in the direction of the electric field. So if the electric field is pushing this way, it's effectively pushing holes away from this barrier, meaning that they don't have the opportunity to get, uh, get into the junction area. Electrons get pushed in the opposite direction of the field. So diffusing electrons are going to be pushed back this way, preventing them from trying to diffuse across that junction of the space charge layer as well, right? So this represents effectively our thermal equilibrium condition where the diffusion current associated with holes and electrons is exactly counterbalanced by the drift current established by this field so that we have no net current and no net charge movement in either direction, which should make sense because at present, this isn't part of a circuit or anything like that. Why should we observe a net current flowing through the device? We shouldn't, right? So this electric field establishes what's called a built-in voltage or a built-in potential, okay? Um, let's scroll down here a little bit. So junction built in voltage. So the charge separation in the depletion region gives rise to a barrier potential that must be overcome in order for holes to diffuse into the end region and electrons to diffuse into the P region. So graphically, our potential barrier is going to look something like this. So this is voltage as a function of position in the crystal. And this is going to be the electric potential of the N side, V sub N. Down here is the electric potential of the P side, which is serving as our reference effectively. And then this point right here is x is equal to zero, the location of our junction. Trying to make sure that this is just as wide as everything that we have above, right? This location right here is negative W P naught. This location right here is capative, cap, uh, excuse me, positive. Wn naught. And so we're going to have a potential distribution that looks something like this. So way out here on the left hand side, all of this region of space, we're electrically neutral. So we really shouldn't have any potential whatsoever. So it's going to start off at zero or whatever the potential of the P side is, once we get into the space charge layer or the depletion region, we are going to start to see that our potential will increase, right? So it's going to gradually increase 
like so until we hit the potential of the P side and then we get to the neutral again and then it stays there. And this height is our built-in barrier potential, V naught, which is simply equal to Vn minus Vp. So this is effectively a way to think about the manifestation of the field, which we'll talk about here in a couple of minutes. But this is just looking at electric potentials on both sides of the crystals, both sides of the crystal, excuse me. So in order to derive a mathematical expression for this value V naught, our built-in potential, we are going to revisit our equilibrium current constraint, right? So effectively, we know that at thermal equilibrium, the diffusion of holes plus the drift of holes must equal to zero, right? Same is true for electrons, but we're just looking at holes for the sake of argument right now. Okay. So we're going to have negative Q times our diffusion coefficient for holes times the derivative of our hole concentrations. plus Q times our whole mobility times our whole concentration times our electric field strength as a function of position is equal to zero. The negative sign comes from the fact that our diffusion and drift are occurring in opposite directions. So we can use Einstein's relationship and a little bit of algebra. And what we'll find is that mu p over dp times ex will be equal to one over P of X times the derivative of P of X. And now putting in Einstein's relationship, this is going to look like negative Q over KBT electric field is the derivative of the voltage and we are effectively going to multiply both sides through by a factor of dx which we're not mathematicians so that's how I'm going to describe what we're doing here and then we're going to take the integrals of both sides, right? So we are going to have negative Q KBT times the integral of dV from the P side to the N side of the crystal is equal to the derivative of 1 over p dp and we're going to integrate with the whole concentration from the p side to the n side of the crystal this in turn gives us negative q over kbt times excuse me vn minus VP is equal to the natural log of PN minus the natural log 
of P sub P. And because we have a linear combination of natural logs, we can express this as just the natural log of P sub N over P sub P. Since Vn minus Vp is nothing more than V naught, the built-in potential that we're trying to solve for, now we just need to move that negative Q over KBT thing to the other side. And so what we get is that V naught is equal to, bless you, KBT over Q times the natural log of the whole concentration on the P side of the crystal divided by the whole concentration on the N side of the crystal. So just to be clear here, moving this negative sign over to the right-hand side winds up flipping this fraction over because effectively we would have ln of P sub P minus ln of P sub N. We move that negative side to the right-hand side. And we can express our whole concentrations in terms of our dopant concentrations, right? So KBT over Q is going to be constant. Natural logs. So what is the whole concentration on the P side of the crystal equal to? NA. What is the whole concentration on the inside of the crystal equal to? Ni squared over Nd. Because we're dividing by Ni squared over Nd, that's going to look like Nd in the numerator, Ni squared in the denominator. This is our relationship for built-in potential. So as a quick example, Let's say that we have a particular PN junction with NA is equal to 10 to the 17 acceptor atoms per cubic centimeter. And ND is equal to 10 to the 16 donor atoms per cubic centimeter. Our intrinsic carrier concentration is 1.5 times 10 to the 10 electron hole pairs per cubic centimeter. And our temperature for 300 Kelvin. We want to find our built-in potential V naught. Well, we have this KDP over Q thing which we know is our thermal voltage because temperature is 300 degrees Kelvin. We're going to call that 26 millivolts to make our lives easier. So 26 millivolts times the natural log of 10 to the 17 per cubic centimeter, 10 to the 16 per cubic centimeter divided by 1.5 times 10 to the 10 per cubic centimeter quantity squared. This comes out to be 0 0.757 volts. Uh, this 1.5 times 10 to the 10, this is a value for silicon that you might find in some textbooks we're going to be using 1.0. Typically speaking, the built-in voltage for silicon is going to be somewhere between 0 0.6 and 0 0.9 volts, depending on our temperature and all of that kind of stuff. For germanium, it's going to be a little, a little bit lower. For gallium arsenide, it's going to be a little bit higher. Right? So we'll wind up using these numbers for things in a little bit. All right. Let's 
I think this is a homework problem that I'm just going to ask you guys just for the hell of it. Um, how much would the built-in voltage increase if either of these except, uh, dopant concentrations were raised by a factor of 10? Why is it taking so long? Whatever the natural log of 10 is. That's it. That's how you can scale it up and down to do whatever you want to do. So that's the effects of doping. If you increase by a factor of 10, you increase V naught by a factor of natural log times 10. All right. Let's look at charge distribution in the depletion region. Roll here just in case anybody wasn't finished. I hear whispering and such from the front row. Do I need to explain something again or further? All right. So we've established already that the depletion region is completely and utterly devoid of charge carriers, right? All of the charge carriers in that region um, recombine with each other, and now we have established an electric field that is preventing further diffusion from occurring. So let me ask you guys a question. Let me scroll up here. I have intentionally drawn the width of the P side of the depletion region to be wider than the width of the N side of the depletion region. Um, can anybody tell me why I drew it that way? You guys have had classes related to this before, right? Arguably last quarter for the overwhelming majority of you, Taj, what's up? There we go. So there's going to be an equal amount of charge stored on both sides of the depletion region. But because the donor, or the, uh, the dopant concentration is higher over here, this side isn't going to extend this far to uncover that same amount of bound charge, right? So whichever side is doped less, we're going to have a wider portion of the depletion rate. Fantastic job, Josh. So let's quantify that by looking at our charge distribution. Okay. Um, So this is our volume charge density as a position of location within the crystal where X is equal to zero corresponds to the site of our junction, right? This is our X axis. And so what we should see is something like this. So this represents our bound charge density on the P side of the crystal. And so this extends from zero to the left to X is equal to negative WP naught. Then over here on the right-hand side, we have our bound positive charge due to our ionized donor atoms. And it's going to extend from W, excuse me, zero out to positive WN naught. And what I'm trying to illustrate here is that the total area of these blobs is the same because the same amount of charge is stored on both sides of the junction. Okay. So mathematically, we can quantify this charge. Let's call it Q plus, or yeah, we'll just leave it as that. It's gonna be the charge of an electron. times the dopant concentration, ND, okay? Because this is effectively telling us how many ions there are per cubic centimeter. 
And now we just need to figure out effectively what volume is encapsulated by, right? In order to get charge. We have charge density and we're trying to get charge out, right? So I'm just going to multiply Q times ND. So that's the charge of an electron or an elementary charge times the number of dopant atoms. So that's giving me some amount of charge per cubic centimeter. And now I'm going to multiply by a volume that is just the cross-sectional area of our junction times the width. Right? So A times W and M. This is our total amount of charge stored on the inside of the junction. Over here will be our total amount of charge stored on the P side of the junction, Q minus, Q and A times A times WP naught and as a secondary thing, W naught is simply WP naught plus WN naught. Total junction width, or the width of the space charge region is just how much extends into the P side, how much extends into the side. So the reason why I was paying attention to the total amount of charge is because we're going, excuse me, because we're going to use Poisson's ratio to figure out what our electric field looks like in this region, okay? So Poisson's ratio relates the electric field gradient to the, uh, excuse me, position dependent space charge as the derivative of the electric field as a function of X with respect to X is equal to Q over epsilon times ND plus minus NA minus, where ND plus is the number of ionized donors and NA minus is the number of ionized acceptors. This is gonna look like a piecewise function, negative Q over epsilon times Na minus for negative omega P naught is less than X is less than zero and positive Q over epsilon ND plus for zero is less than X as less than WN naught. So our field distribution is effectively just going to look something like this. So if this is negative W P naught, and this is positive W N naught, this is what our electric field distribution is gonna look like. Okay? So why does the maximum value occur at the junction? Well, let's think about what's happening as we go from left to right. We're seeing, so we're electrically neutral, and then we start to uncover negative charge. So our field is going to be negative, 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 negative until we hit this point where we have uncovered all of our negative storage charge. And then when we continue moving to the right, now we're adding positive charge into that, which is making the overall field strength fall back down until we hit zero once we get to the neutral region of the crystal again. So this maximum value is what we're gonna call E naught. And it is determined by integrating our electric field. So the integral from zero to E naught DE is going to be negative Q 
over epsilon times Na minus times the integral of dx, excuse me, from negative WP naught to zero. And similarly, on the N side of the crystal, we're gonna have the integral from E naught to zero of DE is equal to positive Q over epsilon and the plus times the integral from zero to WN naught of DX. And from this, we can say that E naught is negative Q over epsilon times Na minus WP naught or negative Q over epsilon and D plus, excuse me, WN naught. The electric field is related to the built-in voltage as E as a function of X is negative, the derivative of the voltage means negative V naught is equal to the integral of the electric field as a function of position when we integrate across the space charge layer. And from this, we find that V naught is equal to negative one half E naught times W or one half U over epsilon ND plus WN naught. We know that, we put this in blue. So this is effectively a substitution that we are about to make. ND plus times W N naught must be equal to N A minus times W P naught and W naught is equal to W P naught plus W N naught. So substituting these relationships in is going to give us V naught is equal to one half Q over epsilon times NA times ND over NA plus ND times W naught squared. And then rearranging this, we can find the width of the depletion region to be given by two epsilon over Q, Na plus ND over NAND times our built-in voltage for the one half power. So this is our depletion region width in terms of our dosage concentration, our built-in voltage, and the material that our junction is made of since epsilon is the permittivity of the material. We can determine how much the junction extends into both the N and P regions as well. So I'll tack that on over here. So WP naught is going to be ND times NA plus ND times W naught. And WN naught is going to be NA over NA plus ND times W naught. So this reinforces what we talked about earlier, right? So 
if we have an N side that is doped significantly more heavily than the P side, meaning NV is much greater than NA, then we'll find that the overall majority of our inflation region lies on the P side of the crystal. Transversely, if the acceptor side is, or the P side is doped much more heavily uh, than the N side, then NA is greater than NV, and we'll find that almost all of the depletion region extends onto the N side of the crystal. One of the last things here, not the last thing, but one of the last things we're going to look at is charge. So the charge stored in our junction, QJ, must be equal to the charge stored on the P side. Actually, that's the N side, my bad. Or the charge stored on the P side. And this is going to look like a, our cross-sectional area, times Q, our elementary charge, times Na, Nd, divided by Na plus Nd, times W naught, or Two Q epsilon A squared and A times N D over N A plus N D times V naught for the one half. Point. All right, so I want to talk about trying to think about how to best introduce this. Um, effectively, if we think about things here. Let's scroll way. Yeah, this will work. We have some amount of positive charge stored on the end side of the junction and some amount of negative charge stored on the P side of the junction. Whenever we have charge that's separated and immobile, this is effectively the exact same thing as a parallel plate capacitor, where the distance between the plates is the depletion region with W0. Right? So we can describe that mathematically. Our junction capacitance C or excuse me, the uh, for parallel plate capacitor if the capacitance is epsilon A over V, putting this in terms of our quantities, we're going to have a junction capacitance C J naught. So this is at thermal equilibrium. That is simply epsilon A divided by W naught. I want to make sure I don't screw this up because I'm not 100% sure that my notes are right, but this derivation is really, really easy. Um, I was going to do it for better or for worse in front of you all. So let me think about things here really quickly just because I'm not sure about my notes. So we have an epsilon. outside 
there should be an equal sign here. That's one thing that I'm screwing up. So we have an epsilon here, and then we're dividing by omega naught, which has a square root of epsilon, in, right? So epsilon divided by square root of epsilon, I feel like it's going to give us a square root of epsilon in the middle. So I feel pretty confident about, put, about putting an epsilon there. We're dividing by omega naught. So I have a one over Q dividing by one over Q is the same thing as multiplying by a Q. So I feel pretty strongly that I should have a Q. And the numerator is also going to have a square root. Everything is going to have a square root. So we get that. All right. Um, I have an A in the numerator. It's going to be in a square root. So it's going to look like an A squared. And then let's see here. Add a two, so that's going to look like a one over square root of two. So that's why this is going to come down here. All right. <clears throat> so now let's worry about this red guy right there, right? So I'm dividing by. square root of this, since I'm dividing by that fraction, it's going to be the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. So Na times Nd over Na plus Nd. And now I'm dividing by V naught under a square root sign. So that's just going to look like a one over V naught. And this whole thing is square root. All right, that's our last relationship. So what we did today was effectively talk about how our junctions are practically, how we're going to look like, uh, and then go through and describe pretty much everything I can think of with respect to how this is going to behave at thermal equilibrium, meaning that we have no external excitations. So our next two class meetings uh, are going to be covering bias PN junctions. So how these quantities change when we forward bias our junction and reverse bias our junction. Um, so we're going to effectively just be modifying these relationships and then talking a little bit about currents and all that kind of jazz because we have external. All right, looks like we got out 10 minutes early. So try to grab a bite to eat for your class at 12 minutes.